Okay. Uh, welcome back to the webinar of the fall edition after the summer break. Uh, I'm Elena Tocci uh, and I'm the committee of the, uh, of, of, of the board for the webinar organization. And uh, today I would like to introduce you uh, Nasser Nava Yoi, that, is, uh, that has joined the editorial board of the Journal of Membrane Science as Early Career Editorial Board. And a small introduction, Nasser is now an associate professor in the chemical department at Umea University. He began as a, his research journey as a membranologist using machine learning for modeling and simulating membrane formation through phase inversion. Then in 2011, Nasser received a scholarship from the South Korea government's world-class university program and started his PhD study studies at the uh, Anyang University, collaborating also with the Institute of Membrane Technology of the National Research Council of Italy. And he earned his PhD in 2015. Then uh, in 2018, after two postdoctoral experience, Nazar became assistant professor in Yuma University at the Department of Chemistry. In next year, he set up a lab focused on membrane separation with advanced tools for gas separation, membrane fabrication. Then in 2021, he was chosen as a promising young researcher by the Royal Swedish Academy at the Faculty of Science and Technology of Umeå University. And then uh, next year, so in 2022, he was promoted to associate professor. Uh, he published several papers uh, in different important journals uh, as a patent, uh, contributed to several book chapters and co-edited a book in, uh, titled Polymeric Membrane Formation by Phase, phase Separation. And uh, today he will also give details about membrane formation for phase separation. I will leave you the floor. Welcome and uh, we'll be I think I, I will disappear for a while. Uh, thank you so much, Elena, for your kind introduction. And uh, thanks for the opportunity uh, for inviting me and giving this chance to me to talk about our uh, research. Um, yes, uh, I'm going to talk about the, uh, the rules of the solvent in membrane formation by phase inversion. Uh, but uh, before that, uh, I'm going to talk about a little bit about my laboratory and Umea University and our very dynamic research environment that we have in here. And then I'm going to talk about the membrane formation by phase inversion. And then um, I am uh, trying to emphasize the main obstacles for introducing uh, new solvent in membrane uh, manufacturing industry. And then uh, we, I am going to talk about the sustainability issue in membrane fabrication. And then, um, depends on the time, I am uh, going to highlight uh, some uh, advantage and disadvantage of the, some green solvents that has been introduced uh, to the membrane community during the past years. And then I will uh, have a, a short summary and finish my presentation, and I would be happy to answer if there is any question. Uh, as Elena mentioned, we, uh, we are located at Umeå University. Uh, in Sweden, uh, we have a um, uh, 48 higher education institute, and Umeå is one of the uh, biggest research uh, universities at Sweden. It's located in the northern part of the Sweden. Uh, uh, Umeå University have a several campus. We are located in the main campus, which is at Umeå uh, City, and uh, our university has uh, four faculty and uh, 67 departments. Uh, more than 350 full professor and more than 4,000 full employees. Uh, so it's a quite a uh, big university and uh, uh, our department, which is a chemistry department, is the biggest department at Umea University. Uh, so uh, I, I would like to put my timer because I'm a quite talkative person if I don't track the time. So, yeah. Um, our department is quite um, uh, big uh, and in terms of the num number of the employees, uh, PhD students, research engineers, uh, professors and so on. And we have a very dynamic research environment. Um, uh, if I want to reflect on the quality of our research, I can highlight that the, the, the winner of the Nobel Prize a couple of years ago was from our department. 
And uh, the section that is more interesting for us as a membranologist is our um, the big program that we have here uh, in Umeå University in collaboration with Luda and Swedish University of Agriculture and many other industry, which we call it Bio for Energy program. And uh, my laboratory is a part of this uh, program as well. So uh, my laboratory is located in Chemical Biological Center. Um, and uh, the research in our department can be divided into three sections, uh, technical chemistry, environmental and biogeochemistry, and biological uh, chemistry. Uh, my lab, which is named as a Nordic membrane, is located in the technical chemistry. And here is the address of the website. You are more than welcome to check our ongoing research. We usually do not update it <laughs> regularly, but the publication section is the section that we try to keep it updated. Uh, a brief history about the Nordic membrane. Uh, it's established in 2019, and uh, um, uh, in 2020, it's become uh, functional. Uh, in 2019, we, uh, we were trying to um, uh, have this uh, required equipment because it was a new research direction in the chemistry department. Um, in 2020, it became uh, active, and in 2021, become uh, one of the most productive um, uh, research, in, uh, research group and lab at the chemistry department. In 2022, we expanded, and in 2023, uh, we, our um, equipment for the gas separation um, uh, start to um, uh, uh, start to operate, which, uh, which is a little bit uh, challenging considering the uh, safety rules and regulation that we have here in Sweden. Uh, I don't talk, um, uh, and I give this information, if there is uh, any interest for the collaboration, uh, I would be more than happy to uh, discuss, and please uh, do not hesitate to contact me. I'm going to talk about now the importance of the solvent in membrane formation by um, uh, phase inversion. So as a membranologist, when we are talking about the membrane, obviously we are considering the sensitive membrane. Uh, we can make this uh, sensitive membrane from a wide range of material. We have a classic, metallic, ceramic, uh, polymeric, uh, zeolite, and many other type of the uh, membranes. But polymeric membranes is at the moment is one of the most um, favorable type of uh, membrane or membrane material, uh, both in academic and industry. And we can make this polymeric membrane by different methods, such as sintering, track etching, stretching, and phase inversion. Uh, phase inversion is the most uh, popular method for uh, membrane uh, uh, polymeric membrane fabrication, both in the industry and in academic. But uh, when we are talking about the phase inversion, we have a different type of the phase inversion. And uh, all of this um, uh, process start by the preparation of the homogeneous polymer solution, which means that we have to dissolve the polymer in a one organic solvent and form a homogeneous polymer solution. In the next step, depends on to the method that we are choosing to separate the polymer from solvent, we can have a thermal induced phase separation if we use a temperature as a, uh, uh, as a factor for inducing phase separation, or we can have a non-solvent induced phase separation if we use a non-solvent. Uh, we can have an evaporation induced phase separation if the solvent evaporate and leave the polymer solution system. Or we can have a vapor induced phase separation if we use the vapor for or um, uh, the phase inversion. Um, recently, during the let's say uh, five to six years, during the past five or six years, there are several research that uh, reported the combination of this one, the combination of the non-solvent and thermal induced phase separation, uh, the combination of the vapor or non-solvent induced phase separation. Uh, but the key point of this, uh, all of this method is that the formation of the homogeneous polymer solution, which required having a solvent with a good solvency power that can dissolve the polymer which method we are using in the next step um, is uh, the, the choice of the method is dictated by the uh, solvent and polymer. So the polymer uh, solution system dictate that which method is the most appropriate for fabrication of the membrane. Um, we can, um, uh, by using the phase inversion, we can prepare a membrane in the flat sheet or in the hollow fiber uh, structure. Uh, we can, if we consider the flat sheet membrane, we can have a, a, a polymer solution and this uh, solvent. Either we can, um, uh, we can 
uh, cast it in the flat sheet configuration by roll to roll casting, or uh, we can have a hollow fiber configuration that we prefer the polymer solution and then steam the hollow fiber. And uh, by using the phase inversion, we can have a symmetric, asymmetric, porous, or dense um, uh, type of the membrane. And so we have, uh, uh, we, we can have a, a wide range of morphology by using the uh, phase inversion method. Um, uh, to understand the rules of the solvent, it's very important that uh, we need to have uh, some information about the phase inversion. I am not going to go to the detail of the, uh, the this type of the phase inversion because it's uh, beyond the scope of this uh, presentation. But I just want to highlight some um, uh, some basic of this phase inversion method. And after that, I want to move to the uh, solvents. Uh, so. Uh, if a, a polymer and an organic solvent form an upper critical solution temperature, um, uh, like the one that we are observing in here, it is possible that um, by, by increasing the temperature of the, um, uh, the system, the solvency power of the solvent increase and then form a homogeneous polymer solution. Then obviously, if we decrease the temperature, then the solvency power is decreasing, and the phase inversion happen. And this is the this phase inversion uh, happened by changing the temperature. That's why we call it thermally induced phase separation. From thermodynamic perspective, or theoretically, it is possible that we have a polymer and solvent that form a lower critical solution temperature, like this one. In that scenario, at low temperature, the polymer and solvent form a homogeneous solution, but by increasing the temperature, the phase inversion happened. Um, I couldn't find uh, any robust membrane uh, prepared by this method. Both of them are the thermal induced phase separation, just to make sure that there is no confusion between these two. In literature, they, they, uh, they refer to this uh, process as a tips and the, uh, the and the another one as a reverse uh, reverse tips. When it comes to the non-solvent induced phase separation, uh, I can uh, uh, I'm not going to the detail of that because there are there is a um, a significant number of publications in the literature and. Uh, let me... Uh, there is a significant number of publication in the literature, and this is a, uh, a video that I take it from YouTube that just to show that in this method, the solvent and polymer form a homogeneous polymer solution at room temperature. And then by uh, introducing a non-solvent, which is the 99% of the time is a water, and in some cases is the uh, water and another um, non-solvent additive such as alcohol. Um, if we put the membrane on that, as you can see here, the phase inversion happened and we have, a, um, we have our membrane. Um, and then of course, there are lots of study about the, um, uh, about the thermodynamic and kinetic aspect of uh, this method. When we go to the vapor induced phase separation, uh, this, uh, in this method, uh, we are using vapor for the phase inversion, uh, but the difference between VIPs and the non-solvent induced phase separation is that in the vapor induced phase separation, we have a phase inversion with a very uh, lower rate. So we can have a better control on the morphology and obtain a very interesting um, structure. Um, um, and there is a review paper that we published in 2020 about the VIPs. And if you are interested, uh, please check it. It's published in the Journal of Membrane Science. And when it comes to the evaporation induced phase separation, in this system, we have a polymer, solvent, and non-solvent all in a one system. But the volatility of the solvent is high. So the solvent is leaving the system. And then because of the non-solvent, the phase inversion happens. These two methods, the VIPs and IPs, are not so popular in the industrial scale. However, the NIPs and TIPs are very popular when it comes to the um, real life and the industrial application. Now, as a membranologist, we always consider polymer and we always track the polymer. What happened during the membrane formation? What happened uh, the, during the solidification, the outer layer rate of solidification, the inner layer, the sub layer rate of solidification. So always we are tracking the, uh, tracking the, uh, the phenomena that happened for the 
polymers because at the end, these polymers form our membrane. But now I would like to invite you, please consider um, the, this uh, membrane formation process from solvent angle of vision. Let's look at what happened for the solvent. Uh, here I design. Here this is a design of the uh, one hollow fiber setup that I was working with that in the past. But um, we have we will have less than a month um, the more sophisticated one with uh, which we can uh, we can prepare a double layer um, uh, hollow fiber membrane up and we can prepare the polymer solution that can go up to 300 degree of C. So uh, I'm just doing a little bit. Uh, advertising if there is interest for collaboration when it comes to the uh, spinning hollow fiber in the larger scale. So um, uh, if we look at this uh, process, uh, we, we can say that uh, this is like a, a spin rate, coagulation bath, washing bath, and the take up the section. So please uh, look at this uh, phenomena from the uh, solvent angle of vision. So in the beginning, we are preparing the uh, a polymer solution in the dope tank and then we put it in the gear pump and it goes to the spin rate. So from this spin rate we have our nascent fiber and then what happened in the next um, in the next step uh, it's entered to the coagulation bus so the solidification happened and then it goes to the washing bus so we are removing the residual solvent and it goes to the take-up section. And this is a very simple design of the hollow fiber. Obviously, it depends on to the uh, polymer and solvent system. We can have an additional uh, function like a cold stretching or hot stretching and coating and so on. That uh, is not um, our uh, concern at the moment. So if you look at this process, we can see that the majority of the solvent is extracted from the polymer solution. Now, if we have a polymer, let's say we have a PVDF 1015 from Solvay company, then we need like a 30% of that minimum concentration to form a, a hollow fiber. And then we can add like a 70% solvent. And if we look at here, 70% of the solvent ideally should be extracted during this process. And then what happened for the, those extracted solvent? As I mentioned, please just focus on the solvent. What happened for those extracted solvent? Well, there is an old trick that they are telling that the dilution is the solution for pollution. So most of the time there is um, this interest to dilute this contaminated water and discharge it to the environment. And in some cases there is interest for the recycling. So to address, uh, so in, when we look at, uh, when we are looking this uh, membrane fabrication, uh, obviously we realize that this is not a sustainable, especially uh, by coming the rules and regulation from the uh, authority. Uh, then I had this, um, um, I had this idea that uh, why we don't introduce a better solvent uh, to improve the sustainability in membrane production. And I had this opportunity to give a lecture uh, in the uh, Euro Membrane 2021 uh, for a young membranologist. And I asked this question from the 27 PhD student who took this uh, lecture. What are the main obstacles for introducing a suitable solvent for membrane production by phase inversion? Um, the answer that I get from them was a very interesting and uh, uh, very useful uh, for me in that time. So beside the solubility, uh, beside the solubility that they highlighted in here, there is a long list of the other factors that we need to consider if we are aiming to have a sustainable membrane production. Some of them are the toxicity, for example, the price, uh, carbon dioxide footprint, recyclability, solubility of the polymer, non-toxic one, the nature of the solvent, disposable, handling, solution stability, biocompatibility, and many others. And this comes from the, um, the PhD student who took these courses, and uh, it was a very valuable information. So I categorized the, um, the, um, the answer or the response that I received from those young membranologists. So if you want to have a good solvent to for introducing to membrane manufacturing, uh, we have to consider a wide range of the parameter. Beyond the uh, solvency power, we have to consider cost, stability, volatile, low volatility, low molecular weight and viscosity, recyclability, availability, 
and toxicity. And these are the uh, parameters that uh, we need to consider. But again, please consider that during the membrane fabrication, we, we are doing our best to extract uh, all the solvent from the, the membrane because any residual solvent in the membrane structure has a negative impact on the uh, separation uh, uh, proper uh, in the um, permeabilities or selectivity of the membrane and also in the mechanical properties of that. So let's uh, start with the last one, which is the uh, toxicity of the uh, solvent. Uh, here is the list of the most uh, popular solvent for membrane formation by phase inversion. When we are looking at this list, we realize that the most popular solvent for membrane for, um, formation by phase inversion are the NMP dimethylastamide, dimethylformamide, in another word, they are the polar aprotic solvent, which are toxic with negative impact on the human health and the environment. And uh, to understand this, um, uh, to understand better uh, the um, uh, problem that we are facing in membrane manufacturing by phase inversion, uh, we, uh, we run a one life cycle assessment. In this study, we tried to um, study the fabrication of the 1000 square meter of the hollow fiber membrane with the, with the procedure that I show you in this uh, in the couple of slides ago. And the aim was that we wanted to identify what are the hot spot for the, um, in terms of the sustainability when it uh, comes to the fabrication of the membrane. Uh, to run this study, we used the most popular solvent in membrane fabrication, which is the NMP, dimethylastamide, and dimethylformamide, and one green solvent, which is the ethylene carbonate. On the other hand, in terms of the polymer, we use the most popular polymers uh, in the membrane industry, which is the PVDF, polysulfone, and cellulose acetate as a biobase. And we run this life cycle assessment. The result of the life cycle assessment was uh, very interesting for us. Obviously, the solvent is the main obstacle for, mem uh, for sustainable membrane production. So the solvent's toxicity, um, as um, you already, I think, realize that because we are extracting all the solvent and we are generating a significant amount of the uh, wastewater annually, based on a one published paper, it is around 50 billion cubic uh, meter. Um, membrane manufacturing uh, industry is uh, producing uh, this amount of the wastewater annually. Um, so when it comes to the, um, in addition to the solvent, there was the energy source and polymer. We cannot do anything about the energy source because the, it, it is the energy source of the entire uh, process. I mean, uh, synthesizing the solvent, synthesizing the polymer, but we can contribute by considering the solvent and polymer. If we look at the environmental impact of the producing of the one kilogram of the solvent, uh, obviously, if we move from uh, polar aprotic solvents uh, such as NMP to the um, uh, to the bio-based solvents such as ethylene carbonate, then we can decrease the environmental impact significantly. And similarly, similarly, we were expecting that if we if we move from the fossil-based polymer such as polysulfone to a bio-based uh, polymer such as cellulose acetate, we were expecting that the environmental impact of the membrane fabrication process is decreasing. But this was not the case. Surprisingly, the result of the life cycle assessment shows that if we move from polysulfone to the cellulose acetate, in some impact area, the environmental impact is increasing. And that's because uh, we cannot make the membrane directly from cellulose. So there is a one acetylation step to converting cellulose to cellulose acetate. And during this acetylation step, we are using some chemical that has a more negative impact on the environment. So uh, uh, moving or shifting from fossil-based material to the bio-based material does not necessarily mean that we are decreasing the environmental impact. Uh, we had a very, um, uh, very strong conclusion, very interesting conclusion from our point of view, and that is that a green solvent, or in a, in a broader um, con context, we can say that 
a green material that is prepared in a toxic manner is not a solution for sustainable membrane production. So we followed on this study, we, uh, uh, we um, tried to add to the ethylene carbonate a couple of other structures, which is the polypyrene carbonate and butylene carbonate. And uh, we um, prepared membrane by, um, by using the PVDF as a polymer. And uh, we studied the, uh, the um, thermodynamic aspect of phase inversion, and we went to the detail of the morphology of that. This is a published paper, so you can um, your, uh, you can read the detail of that. So I'm just trying to highlight the important part of that. Um, uh, one interesting result that uh, we obtained when we used the ethylene carbonate as a better solvent. I'm not going to use a green uh, terminology when I'm talking about the different solvent. Um, before running a life cycle assessment for that specific solvent. So uh, ethylene carbonate, um, um, we use it for the for fabrication of the PVDF membrane and we obtain a, a pure beta phase. And this uh, polymorphism of the PVDF membrane is very interesting and it has a wide range of application and the in membrane size and beyond the um, uh, membrane size. Uh, and then we study that why it happened and we realized that the solvents also can play important roles when we want to uh, fabricate a piezoelectric membrane uh, because uh, the interaction of the solvent with the uh, semi-crystalline polymer such as PVDF help to, um, um, uh, to orientate uh, the polymer chain in a zigzag manner and for a better uh, phase PVDF. And of course, we test this uh, membrane for membrane uh, distillation, and the result was interesting. Um, uh, but we are not the only research group, and we are not the first one that we focus on the solvent. Indeed, this research is started by uh, Professor Derioli and Professor Young Muli back in 2010, 2011. And the first paper that uh, we published in that period was uh, using the ATBC. Uh, and uh, now I'm trying to, um, uh, did, before this presentation, I tried to classify uh, the type of the solvent that we have. Um, but I only focus on the PVDF. Uh, please, uh, um, uh, please, um, I, I, I'm aware of the uh, PFAS problem and um, uh, this, uh, the, the difficulty in the PVDF in terms of the environmental impact, but we choosing PVDF because of its thermal, chemical, and mechanical strengths. So when we look at the PVDF, uh, this is a list of the green solvent uh, this, we can categorize the green solvent in the literature to these groups. Uh, this is a roughly uh, um, uh, uh, dividing. Uh, it's possible that we uh, we have uh, uh, we miss some of them. Uh, but I'm going. Uh, I'm trying my best to uh, cover all of this solvent, or at least um, uh, one from each category. So I already talked about the cyclic carbonate. Um, let's move to the uh, ester-based solvent. This solvent is a, um, a very uh, popular, and as you can see, it's uh, one of the uh, most popular uh, when it comes to the formation of membrane by uh, PVDF. And uh, this is the, the, the first, one of the first paper that highlighted the um, environmental impact of the membrane formation. And um, it, it's published uh, quite a long time ago. It's like a, a 10 years ago um, in 2013. Uh, ATBC uh, is a food plasticizer, and it's uh, very interesting when it comes to the uh, fabrication of the membrane by phase inversion. So, uh, same as um, other solvent, it has its own advantage and disadvantage. The advantage of the ATBC, um, which is ester-based solvent, is that it is not water soluble. So, um, uh, it's uh, the fabrication of the membrane is a pure tips method. And because it is a pure tips method, we can get a membrane with a very sharp pore size distribution, as you can see in here. Um, and this is a hollow fiber membrane that we fabricated by using the tips method. This is an advantage of the ATBC, but the disadvantage of that is, uh, first of all, the cost of this um, solvent is a little bit high. And then it, um, because it is not water soluble, we need to um, use alcohol. 
or um, uh, or other type of the material for extraction of the ATBC from the um, uh, from the membrane structure. When we are thinking this one in the lab scale, it is okay. But when it becomes the large scale, then that alcohol and recycling that that will be a little bit um, uh, challenging. There are some studies that they use ATBC for uh, making membrane um, by using different type of other type of the polymers such as ECTFE and so on. But uh, then in those um, uh, in those study, then the stability is uh, one of the uh, main concern. Uh, the second uh, group again in the uh, ester base is the T TGDA. And uh, this solvent in the country of the ATBC is a water soluble. Uh, but it cannot dissolve PVDF at room temperature. So this means that we have to prepare a polymer solution uh, and increase the temperature at, uh, to the certain temperature, depends on to the polymer concentration. And so at elevated temperature, they are forming a homogeneous polymer solution. And then we have to cool it down uh, to the, the phase inversion happen. And the, for cooling down, and the, the TIPS process, almost all the study are using the water. When the solvent is the water soluble, then we will have a both the TIPS and NIPS at the same time. And that is the problem that the majority of the green solvent that is um, reported in the literature, uh, the majority of them are the water soluble and they, for, they have a TIPS and NIPS at the same time. And uh, we do not have a deep understanding about this process. And in most cases, it forms a dense layer for in the membrane. And that is the drawback of that. Another drawback of this solvent is the significant cost. It's very expensive. This is an uh, expensive solvent. Uh, the uh, third solvent that I want to uh, uh, talk about in the... Uh, uh, Okay, I have enough time. The third uh, uh, solvent that I would like to talk about that is the Polar Clean. Uh, well, I published the first paper in Polar Clean in uh, 2015, 2014, as a part of my PhD. And that moment I was very happy with that. Uh, the reason the difference between the Polar Clean and the uh, two other uh, and the TGDA is that it is water soluble, but it's biodegradable. So um, uh, the, the it doesn't matter how much we are good in the recycling uh, solvent, we are releasing some in the, in the environment and uh, polar clean uh, biodegradability is a, a good factor. I don't have uh, information about the cost. I don't have information about the entire life cycle of the um, this solvent, even though we have a patent with Professor Drew Lee and Professor Lee and Solvay Company on this, and even though it's com commercially available, but the information about the entire life cycle of this solvent is not available. So um, I cannot give a comment that how green is this solvent. And these are the advantage and disadvantage of that. Uh, another group of the solvent that I would like to talk about that is the ionic liquid. Well, uh, when we are uh, talking about the ionic liquid, uh, it has an anionic part and cationic part, and it's a very um, large number of solvents. It's a very big family of the solvents. Um, I am very pessimistic of the um, using ionic liquid in the future membrane uh, fabrication. In my humble opinion, there are several problems when we are uh, looking at the ionic liquids. The first problem is the cost. So the, when we want to synthesize ionic liquid, liquid, we have a pre-treatment, synthesizing, post-treatment. So the complexity of the synthesizing, the cost of that, lack of information about the environmental impact and impact our, uh, in the human health of the anionic part and cationic part. These are the factors that uh, really make me think that does it have a future in the membrane manufacturing industry? In addition to that, uh, some ionic liquid that have, they have a good solvency power, but they have a high viscosity, uh, which means that um, the, the liquid by itself has a high viscosity, so we cannot dissolve more than 10 or 15 percent of the uh, polymer on that. And after that, the viscosity uh, increasing in a way that the, um, the polymer solution is not processable. So if we have, uh, for example, 10 or 15 percent and we try to spin the fiber with that, when we are extracting the 
when we are extracting the uh, solvent from the um, from the hollow fiber, the remaining polymer concentration is not good enough to to support a um, uh, formation of the defect free hollow fiber. So because of this reason, I am not uh, a big fan of the ionic liquid and I'm not sure it, uh, it's, uh, it can have a future uh, in a large scale. But you know, it's a science and maybe uh, tomorrow one uh, young member analogist come with the ionic liquid that fulfill all the criteria that we are looking for. However, I'm very optimistic to the one subclass of ionic liquid, which we call it deep aotactic solvent. And this solvent is consists of the one hydrogen donor and one hydrogen acceptor. We can mix this to increase the temperature. At elevated temperature, the hydrogen bonding between the hydrogen donor and hydrogen acceptor is formed, and it forms a, um, a homogeneous solution. It doesn't need a pretreatment. It doesn't need a post-treatment. It is cheap. It is scalable. We are synthesizing this one in my lab in the kilogram scale. So this solvent has a, uh, has a, a very interesting um, uh, properties and it's a family of the solvent. Uh, but the problem of this solvent is the solvency power of the deep air tactic solvent. There are some paper published that they use deep air tactic solvent as an additive which is a very interesting approach. And also there are some, um, uh, some published paper that they claim that this deep aerotactic solvent as a co-solvent. Well, I am not agree with that because we can call a co-solvent when, this, um, when both of those solvent can uh, individually dissolve the polymer. So if the, one of the solvent cannot dissolve it, we cannot call it as a co-solvent. It's a solvent and non-solvent additive. Uh, we, we did uh, so much experiment on the deep air tactic solvent and we couldn't find a good um, solvent that can dissolve the PVDF even at high temperature. Then we, um, uh, then we synthesized the non-ionic deep air tactic solvent, which is a little bit more stable considering in comparison with deep air tactic solvent. And then um, we fabricate the membrane and um, uh, we, we use the membrane for the um, different application. And uh, again, these are the published paper and you can uh, check that one. But the advantage of the, this, uh, this family of the solvent is that uh, we can prepare it in the kilogram, in the lab scale. It's a wide range of family. It doesn't need a pretreatment or post-treatment and um, there is a cost effective. Uh, another group of the solvent that uh, I want to talk about is a diabasic ester, which is again in the est um, uh, um, ester-based uh, family. Um, the reason that I uh, bring this one um, independently is that when we are using this solvent, it's uh, uh, help us to prepare a membrane with uh, by continuous structure. So if we look at the uh, phase diagram uh, for the tips process, we have such a this um, a structure. And then if we have a phase inversion in here, it's a liquid liquid separation in here. We have a solid liquid phase separation. The majority of the solvent that we are introduced as a green solvent for PVDF, they are choosing this path resulting in a spherulid structure. This spherulid structure, they are not mechanically strong. Their permeability and selectivity is not very interesting. But for the people who are working in the membrane formation by tips, it is very important to have this structure, which is a bicontinuous a structure. In this structure, the pores are interconnected. So if we have, a, um, if we have a, um, for example, external tension, this connection are, um, uh, are distributing this, for, uh, this tension. So they have a very high mechanical strength. As you can see here, for example, this is the, uh, the study that we have with 18% uh, um, uh, of using the polymer. And uh, we we come uh, and we got the interconnected structure and uh, the mechanical properties is um, the significantly higher than the previously reported flat sheet membrane and also in terms of the flux and rejection and that goes back to the uh, interconnected structure that we can get it and this shows that the solvents um, uh, not only play important role in the dissolution phase inversion but also in the morphology of the membrane. And then uh, the uh, result of the uh, polymorphism uh, shows that they are forming uh, pure alpha phase. We use this membrane for the uh, desalination 
and synthesize nuclear wastewater decontamination. So um, one more time, if I want to go back here, I talk about the toxicity. I talk about the availability, uh, which is very important. For instance, we can synthesize some type of solvent in our lab, in my lab. We have um, some uh, type of new solvent that we synthesizing, but we can synthesize this solvent in the gram. I mean, one gram, two gram. It's a three-step synthesizing, including one step is a crystallization. But what we need in the membrane uh, as a membranologist is in the kilogram scale. So the availability is very important. Uh, there are not so many research that focus on the recycling process, uh, how we want to recycle this new um, uh, solvent. It doesn't matter if it's green or not. It's very important that we try to approach to the uh, zero liquid discharge. Uh, the importance of the viscosity I highlighted and low molecular weight is, um, uh, is uh, uh, helping us to extract uh, residual solvent from membrane structure. And um, uh, low volatility and stability, these two are the same factor. And uh, as I mentioned, it is very important that um, the solvent that we are using be stable in the fabrication condition. We can have a solvent that is stable in 20 and 30 degrees of C, but our fabrication condition by tips is like a 180 degrees of C. So it's very important to be stable in the fabrication condition. And the last point is the cost, uh, which is the most uh, one of the most important when it comes to the real life application. Well, when we are looking at the cost of the membrane and the cost of the solvent, we can say that the polar aprotic solvent, which are toxic, indeed they are not cheap. I mean, you can see it's like 125 uh, euro per liter. Uh, and then uh, some other green solvents, such as siren, is even more, is like a, a 200, or TGDA, as I mentioned, is like a 200. So these are the uh, quite expensive uh, solvent. But we have some um, uh, we have some alternatives, such as ethylene carbonate so, or or a DMA, that is a, a significantly lower. But our knowledge in the membrane formation by using this solvent is not uh, completed, and there are are um, so many knowledge gap exist. Uh, now I want to uh, finish my uh, presentation by uh, giving a summary. And uh, in summary, I can say that, first of all, there is a need for a better solvent for membrane formation by phase inversion. And that's because we are aiming, for having, uh, we are aiming to have a sustainable membrane fabrication. And there is a list of properties beyond the solvency power that we have to consider. For instance, for the people who are working, for example, in the gas separation, and they are, are synthesizing a, a fascinating type of the pins, and then they are just using chloroform, and then uh, they let it, the chloroform evaporate, and they have the, 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 the film, and they test it for gas separation. And that's amazing, but when we want to use this one in the real life application, then we have to consider not only the solvent that can dissolve that polymer, but also a, a long list of other properties that I mentioned in here. Uh, we need to have a better understanding about the uh, N tips or non-solvent induced non-solvent induced phase separation and thermally induced phase separation. Well, the majority part of the green solvent or better solvent that we have in the literature are water soluble, but they can dissolve PVD at high temperature. So the majority part of the result is a combination of the uh, NIPs and TIPs. And we do not have a deep knowledge on that. There are some pioneering uh, publication by uh, some professors, for example, Professor uh, Matsuyama from Kobe University uh, for or controlling the um, um, pore in the skin layer of the membrane. Uh, but uh, we, are, um, uh, we are not in that point to uh, have a confidence uh, to uh, scale up that method. And they were using the, those kind of the double layer uh, hollow fiber membrane for controlling the um, outer layer of the um, fibers. Uh, we need to consider the entire life cycle of the solvent or materials. Uh, in, in the literature, there are some uh, solvents that we can say that it is green, okay? But there is no information about life cycle of that. And the, the result of our LCA was a perfect example that shows that a green material that is prepared in a toxic manner I mean, it is not a solution. So we have to consider the entire life cycle of that. And also we need to consider the recycling the solvent. 
Um, uh, at the end, I would like to invite you to, uh, to check our book, which will be published uh, very soon. It's, uh, it's not online yet. And in this book, you can um, uh, get some information about the uh, uh, member information by different phase inversion method, solvents, sustainability, uh, and modeling, and so on. And with this, I want to say thank you very much once again for this opportunity. And I'm ready to answer uh, any question, if there is any. Okay, Nasser, thank you very much for a really interesting and clear um, webinar. I think really interesting for the new possibilities that you also uh, commented. Uh, up to now, we have no um, new information, no requests, so I have also some of yours. You said that essentially at the moment, um, uh, new in conclusion, new solvents are required, but also a lot of work has to be done, uh, also as the students have uh, made a suggestion. So which is the most important parameter you think you have to, have to be used or to be considered uh, referring to the new availability? Uh, uh, I believe if, uh, we, uh, if we want to consider uh, using the solvent at the moment, uh, considering the restriction that we have for polar apoptotic solvent, um, the, 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 there is a both toxicity and cost. These two is very important at the moment. I cannot choose one of them because uh, um, uh, because it's very difficult. Uh, if if I say on the toxicity, uh, the, but the industrial uh, sector they are really considering the cost. So. Okay, we have a question from uh, Yusak Artanto. Uh, phase inversion and uh, interfacial polymerization generate wastewater, organic, green solvent, plus water. Do you think moving from phase inversion to dry fabrication process is a good direction? Uh, to the dry fabrication process. Mm, uh, well, uh, I would like to highlight a sentence that my supervisor told me when I was taking the membrane engineering course, uh, maybe 10 years ago. And uh, I mean, uh, Professor Drioli mentioned that if you go to the literature, there are dozens of the polymers. But when you come into membrane industry, there are few polymers available. That's they are fulfilling the needs of the membrane science and technology and they are available in large scale and they're cost effective and so on so uh, any method that you think that can be substituted with the phase inversion you have to think that can i make a pvdf membrane with that can i make a polytosulfur membrane with that then in that case maybe it has a future but um, uh, if if we cannot make like a, um, a polytosulfur membrane with that then we are uh, we are uh, a little bit uh, far from the real life application and that's my humble opinion because it was a very broad question okay uh, at the moment no other question so um, i think that i thank you very much again for your uh, uh, webinar i think this uh, you can find also online and uh, as you also suggested uh, you people can also directly write to you for any collaboration and also just for simple uh, uh, question. So with this, I would like to thank you again and uh, uh, let's uh, meet to the next uh, October webinar. You soon will uh, receive a new... Ah, is, is also another one, another question that says, it is possible to recycle solvent like SRNF? Uh, which solvent? SRNF. S -R -N -F. It, is, it is possible to recycle solvent with SRNF. Okay, okay, it is possible to recycle. Well, as I mentioned in my presentation, the uh, uh, our uh, I personally I do not have or I haven't seen so many research on the focus on the recycling of the solvent. And um, I don't know if you mean um, uh, solvent resistant nanofiltration is uh, one option for the separating that one. Well, it depends on type of the solvent, type of the membrane, and uh, 
Uh, but uh, when it comes to the separation, of course, the membrane is the one low energy intensive separation unit and can play important roles. Um, but it absolutely depends on that. And um, uh, the, I know that uh, this organic solvent uh, nanofiltrations uh, has a great future in this sense, uh, but it is uh, not my expertise. So I, I prefer to don't give a comment on that. Uh, Amir, we have also uh, really new, a lot of new questions. So <laughs> I will start showing the next one that is uh, taking into account the membrane formation cycle, particularly membrane based on cellulose acetate. What do you think for of electrochemical methods to reduce the chemical impact of the acetylation phase? Uh, well, um, uh, the result of our life cycle assessment may, uh, surprised us because we were expecting when we were moving, moving from fossil base to bio base, well, we are, we are making more sustainable membrane. But then we realized that no, in the process, we have to consider entire the process. Now, the main obstacle based on our um, research was in the acetylation step. If we find um, an agreement, or um, a more sustainable uh, method for acetylation step, then uh, definitely the environmental impact is uh, decreasing. But which acetylation step, uh, which acetylation step is better? Or uh, I don't know. Uh, that is the the the, uh, the this is uh, something that needs uh, further study. It's not. Uh, uh, I am not expert on the uh, cellulose-based um, polymers. I mainly focus on the fossil base, unfortunately. I know I'm talking about the sustainability, but PVDF is my main expertise. Okay, other two questions. One is, uh, how about the future of deep eutectic solvents in terms of cost and processability? Well, uh, deep eutectic solvent, um, in terms of the cost, they are quite cheap. I mean, they're very cheap. We can, uh, so it is cheap, let's uh, compare with the ionic liquid. Uh, ionic liquid is expensive, deep eutectic solvent is cheap. Ionic liquid needs a pre-processing, complex uh, synthesizing, and post-treatment. Deep eutectic solvent doesn't need any of that. And uh, you can just simply, is it like a two salt, two solid, you are um, mixing together, increasing the temperature, you have your solvent, as simple as this one. So uh, in terms of the cost, scalability, availability is very promising. But when it comes to the solvency power, because we test this solvent for the PVDF and polyether sulfone and couple of fossil-based polymer. Well, the solvency power of this solvent was not good enough based on our case study. Remember, this is the hydrogen donor, hydrogen acceptor, and hydrogen donor is a wide range of family. Hydrogen acceptor is a wide range of family as well. So we have a few case study, and in our case study, we didn't find a sol good solvency power on that. But this doesn't mean that it doesn't work. It, there is a room for the uh, research and development. So maybe one of the young membranologists come with the, a good combination of the hydrogen donor and hydrogen acceptor that can um, uh, do the job. And the last one is also, uh, thanks for the nice presentation. I have two questions. What do you think about making membranes from polyelectrolyte complexing using only water as solvent? Mm -hmm. And yep. okay, then I will read also the another the other question is: Do you prefer polymer or solvent as green? Um, okay, uh, let's uh, start with the, the, the first one. Well, the first method, I know there are some uh, good research group. They are active on the uh, this type of the. Uh, making membrane uh, with the polyelectrolyte. Uh, but again, I go back to the, my uh, previous comment. Can we make a PVDF membrane with that? Can we make a polyethylene cell phone membrane with that? If cannot, well, personally, I prefer to use a method that we can use this type of good polymer, which is very well established. But um, um, uh, meanwhile, we have to uh, consider that the, the um, research and development um, in the um, uh, those type of fabrication me method is promising. Uh, it's uh, in terms of scalability, I think they are promising. But in terms of the material, um, I prefer to don't say anything to make sure that none of my colleagues is getting upset of me. But I prefer to work with the uh, the, uh, the material that is well established in the membrane industry, so we can give a solution. 
that is close to the real life application. And the second question, uh, I forgot the second question. Uh, do you prefer polymer or solvent as green? Well, uh, the result of the LCA shows that the, uh, the, uh, the source, uh, the main obstacle for sustainable membrane production was solvent, energy source, and polymer. So the solvents has the highest in terms of the um, um, negative impact on the environment and, and so on. And um, the energy source is the entire, so it's out of our hand, it's a government. For example, in Sweden, we have a, a significant um, portion of the uh, our energy, which is electricity coming from nuclear. Uh, so, uh, but it depends on the location. We cannot do anything about the energy. So the, the highest um, I mean, priority at the moment for us is the solvent. And uh, when it comes to the polymer, well, it depends on which scale you are talking about. If you are talking about the lab scale, well, we can play a lot. But when it comes to the large scale, well, we have a few options available. Okay. Um, Ahmar Samadi um, was thanking you for the presentation and response. And now we have also a new answer. That is, uh, thanks for inciting presentation and area that need to be explored. What about the toxicity? This uh, toxicity of an exam used dura during interfacial polymerization and other issue related to membrane fabrication. Um, uh, using the n hexane during the interfacial polymerization. Yes. Well, I, I think you already answered your question. That is, uh, that is the, first of all, when, when we have an hexane, it has a very low boiling point. And uh, then you have to consider that uh, how you want to handle this one in the larger scale. I don't see that one as a sustainable solution. And um, uh, so it, it is not sustainable. We need to have a better or greener approach for that. OK. So other thanks for my nice presentation. And uh, seems that for the moment, uh, we finished our question time. Uh, so thank you all the people all the, uh, for making questions. Thank you also for your presentation again. And I think this time we can leave and uh, thank you again for this uh, webinar. Okay. Thank you so much, Elena. Thank you. Bye-bye.